Welcome everyone to the Zorch Podcast, Conversations with Leaders and Legends. I am Chris Zorch, and on today's show, we have a person who covers actually both categories of leaders and legends. Now, I haven't done this at all. Like, literally, the intros are like maybe a minute. This is going to be a little bit. He was the defensive coordinator for Notre Dame's last national championship, became the head coach of Wisconsin, won three Big Ten championships, numerous Coaches of the Year awards, inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame, and that was just as a coach. As an athletic director at Wisconsin, his team has won over – or his team has won 10, 16 national championships, 74 Big Ten titles, and has built facilities and tra- has transformed the whole athletic department. One of the first members – of the college football playoff selection committee in 2001 the hispanic business magazine named him their one of their 100 most influential hispanics and after 32 years at wisconsin he just retired and oh by the way was called to the big 10 to advise and oversee football operations Ladies and gentlemen, this is Coach Barry Alvarez. Coach Alvarez, thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, absolutely, Chris, and pleasure for me to to be on with you. I've had the pleasure of of seeing you on with uh, a couple of my former your teammates <laughs> and my former players that I've had a, a great pleasure watching your show. So uh, always have had great admiration for you and uh, a pleasure for me to be on. Well, thank you very much, sir. And, and the reason why this is special for me is you've been one of the types of coaches that I think all of the coaches should be like. Care about his players, um, loves his players, understands his players, but more importantly, understands what makes them successful. Okay, so what I mean by that is you take a ragtag team of some some athletic players, maybe some not so athletic players at Notre Dame, you mold us as a defensive coordinator and we go on to have crazy success. You have a chance to become a head coach and you hear stories about individuals who come back, individuals who care about the program because you were in charge. They that they thought so much of you and the success you had at Wisconsin that you, you become the athletic director, which I think is so interesting because I kind of want to go back to kind of where all this started. Where did your leadership qualities come from, your coaching ability? Um, your grandparents were immigrants from Spain in a small town in Pittsburgh, right? Yeah, they came from northern Spain, uh, both grandparents. Actually, my father was born in the United States, uh, actually in Illinois. Uh, when he was 10 years old, his parents came to, to this country to get enough money to go back and buy property. Mm. So he had to move back when he was 10 years old. Um, he did not want to leave. He said, you know, I'm playing Little League. I got a bicycle. I don't want to go back to Spain. Oh. So he went back. They went back. They bought pro- beautiful property. I've been back there in northern Spain, Asturias, Spain. Uh, Asturias is the province. And... Um, and so when he was 17, that's when the Civil War broke out. My dad's American citizen, Franco, wanted them, him to declare he said an American citizen. They threw him in a prisoner of war camp, and his 17-year-old brother or 19-year-old brother um, negotiated for him for a French prisoner and sent him back to the United States oh my and, at, at 19 years old. So... Um, there was a, a Spanish, a group of Spanish people who did the same type of work in our area, you know, mills and, and and that type thing. And that's how they ended up in Western Pennsylvania. Oh, my God. That's an amazing story. Wow. Wow. And so the love that he had for kind of sports and kind of this newfound excitement, I mean, how did you get into athletics? I mean, were you one of those kids who played every sport? Yeah, I was. You know, where I grew up in Western Pennsylvania, you have to, you, you think back to the 50s and uh, and 60s, um, you know, it was a melting pot, every nationality. 
you know, Zorich is probably Serbian or Croatian or, mm-hmm. or something like that. Right. I grew up with Serbs and Crows and, wow. and, and Italians <laughs> and every, and we were a melting pot and our, my little community was a, was a, a company town. I grew up in a company town. Okay. You know, with a cat system where the houses, the big house was the owner and then that, 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 that right down the, mm. right down the line. And, uh, and they worked hard. They worked very hard. They worked in most of them. When I got there, most of them worked in uh, steel mills. And uh, athletics was really important. And their entertainment on the weekends and during the week was their kids playing athletics. Wow. High school basketball, little league foot, little league football, little league baseball, high school sports. That's what they did. And, and it was important to us. And so, um, I was really, really fortunate in my little town. I'm talking about a little town. Uh, we had about probably 10 small mining towns around one community. We all went to the same high school, but we all had different grade schools. And uh, athletics was the most important. That was what brought us together. Mm. And that's what our that was our parents' entertainment. When wow. I think back on it, that was their entertainment. They went and watched us play on weekends and all the games. And so it was important. And I was really fortunate that I had very, very good coaches from the time I started little league baseball, basketball, football. I had unbelievable Mm. uh, coaches as, you know, I'm thinking about tendencies and looking at line gaps and watching different things as a (laughs) a 10 year old, you know? So uh, I I really felt when I, I went to Nebraska, uh, when, when they were pretty good and they just had turned the program around, I felt like I was ahead of, of everyone else there. Wow, that's guys amazing. from Chicago that came in, they just won the city league. I felt I was, I was coached better than they were. Mm. Mm. Well, and it's interesting because, I mean, you, you, you kind of talk about learning the game at that young age, and you go to a program – in Nebraska, that's, I mean, that's huge. I mean, what, what was the opportunity you had? I mean, were you, were you looking at other schools where Nebraska, I, they just won? No, I, I was, you know, I was a pretty good player. And uh, so I was being recruited. Uh, I took a trip to Arizona State. I, I, I was my first nice. airplane ride. That's <laughs> why so I went out there. I'd never seen anything. I'd never seen mounds. I'd never seen anything. Oh my and gosh. so I, I went out there. Frank Bush was the coach. Um, you know, went to Nebraska. You know, West Virginia is right down the road. Uh, they recruited me. Pittsburgh. Uh, I, I didn't. I, you know, I, I, I used to tease Joe Paterno and I used to tease each other. He said, "Alvarez, I didn't recruit you because you had a fat ass and you were slow." <laughs> <laughs> I said, "Yeah, but I went on and played." Pretty well in Nebraska. Oh all God. your teams. <laughs> you know, we, we, we used to have a lot of fun. I have great respect for him. Oh. But, yeah, I had a chance to go. But the, the, there was a coach. I wanted to play in bowl games, Sore. Okay. I, 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 um, I'll never forget this. I, you know, you sit there. Back when I grew up, there were four big games. On your, mm. New Year's Day, you got up in the morning, and you watched the – I think it was the Cotton Bowl first. Then it was the uh, – Sugar Bowl second, mm. then it was the the Rose Bowl, and then the Orange Bowl, and that was and all. A couple other smaller ones. Right. I dreamt I wanted to play in those games, wow. and Nebraska had just turned the corner. Bob Devaney had gone there in '62, and he he beats Bud Wilkinson in '63, and breaks his his long winning streak. Okay. Nebraska goes to the Orange Bowl, and they they were recruit. They started recruiting me. There was a guy from my hometown named John Milton, and he recruited me from the first day he could. He stayed with me. Wow. And, uh, and I can remember telling friends, I want to play in bowl games. Mm. And I did. You know, my freshman year, we go there. We, we, we were ineligible. They played in the Cotton Bowl uh, against the, uh, Arkansas. The next year, my first year, we, we were eligible to play in the Orange Bowl. Next year, in the Sugar Bowl. So, um got a chance to play in bowl I, that's what i wanted to do i love bowl games that's amazing that that is amazing so the idea that you, you want to coach where did that come from well um that's what i liked that's what i'm good at uh i always i, I was always more than just a player 
Okay. I, I used to study the game. Uh, I really did. I studied the game. I watched. I really, really um, was enamored by Coach Devaney. Coach Devaney was really a special guy. I thought he was way ahead of his time in how he how we practiced, how he approached players, how he dealt with people. Um, he could come to Pittsburgh, and he could come to my hometown, and he'd be in the Slovenian club drinking beer and playing <laughs> poker with the boys smoking a cigar. Wow. The next day I'd see a picture of him, and he'd be in Pittsburgh in a tux. Mm. He'd, he'd be the center of attention at both places. Wow. The next day he'd be on Johnny Carson show. Wow. You know, I, I just really – loved him and how he dealt with everything and how he dealt with us as players. And, and so I tried to, I, I said, I want to be like coach of Benny. I, when I got married, Cindy knew it exactly what I wanted to do. He started in high school. He worked his way up. He got a break uh, at Michigan state uh, with Duffy Doherty and Biggie Munn mm-hmm. to go on, on his leave high school to go as an assistant. Then went to Wyoming as a head coach and then to Nebraska but that's what I did. I, I I wanted to, I wanted to do what he did, and I wanted to be a head coach in school. I wanted to win. I wanted to go someplace, build a program, sustain it, be the athletic director, and and keep it going. And that's that is crazy. I've been able to do that. And, that, and is, that is absolutely it's hard. To, you know, I, in my interview with Pat Richter when I interviewed for this job, sitting in my house in South Bend before we went to the Orange Bowl. Uh huh. He said, so what do you envision yourself doing? I said, I envision myself winning a lot of games. And then I'm going to take your job when you retire. That's what I told him in my interview. Wow. And where did, so thinking back, I mean, even as a player in Nebraska, is this what you wanted? I mean, did you want to be the athletic director after a career was over or is this kind of, you know, Hey, you know, you saw how it worked with Iowa, Notre Dame. Hey, I could be no. an administrator when I'm done. No, not, not not that far. I was just trying to get on. I just wanted to be – I just wanted to get on the field. Okay. Back then we had – you know, we, were, we we had so many goddamn guys on the team <laughs> at Nebraska. You had to fight your ass off. And, you know, you had to fight. I wanted to play. I wanted to mm. get on the field. You know, back in those days, there were no there were no limits in scholarships. Okay. In the big <laughs> wow. And, and we had – in the spring, we had five offenses, five defenses. We Jeez. scrimmage in shifts on Saturdays. Three teams of scrimmage in the morning, three offense, three defense in the morning, two in the afternoon. And at wow. the end of spring, they the they call every guy in, you know, other than the, the starters. Right. And, it, you know, if you weren't high enough on the depth chart, you were gone. Oh. They take your scholarship. That's the way it worked. Wow. And so I was fighting, you know, early on, early in my career, I was fighting. I wasn't just want to be on the field. I wanted to mm. play. So mm. I wasn't worried about where I was going to do that. Sure, sure. But I knew, you know, as I went along, I wanted to, I wanted to do what Coach Devaney was doing. Well, and that's what's interesting because you're able to make that transition. You coach in high school, and then how does Hayden Fry? grab a high school coach and put him on the staff? Well, um, you know, I, I went to Iowa. Uh, I was coaching in, in Lexington, Nebraska. So this is, this is a good story. You'll like this. So I, I my, right out of college, I took a job right at Lincoln Northeast. Okay. Lincoln. So if you go to – if you're in the education school in, Nebraska, in Lincoln University, at the University of Nebraska, they'll hire everybody at the School of Education – Applies in Lincoln. They hire five. <laughs> wow. Cindy and I were two of the five. Wow. But I, the only reason because I'm going to coach at Lincoln Northeast. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm a coach at Lincoln Northeast. And, but they won't elevate an assistant in the system there to be a head coach. So I knew I had to be a head coach. And uh, after four years as an assistant, as a high school coach, um, there's a job open in Lexington, Nebraska, which is a tiny town of 6,000 in the middle of the state. It's Monty Kiffin's hometown. Wow. And Monty was my grad assistant and, and a friend 
And oh. I had someone that I admire, had admired. Monty got me the job. Wow. And I take the job and, and, and I interviewed there and I'm coming back and Cindy, my, you know, Cindy's in the car and I said, Sam, I'm going to take this car job. She cried all the way home. <laughs> she did. She cried all the way home. And uh, so anyhow, we, we take the job. We love the play. We, 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 we absolutely loved it. We had, we, we inherited uh, a team that was, uh, they had won a lot of games there, but we, we inherited all sophomores. They okay. said, you can't win with sophomores. We won. We were, ended up second in the state two years in a row. Now they're seniors. I get, I have the best team in the state. Five kids off this team ended up playing at Nebraska. This is a class B. Class A is a, we have class B. I have five that play at Nebraska. Wow. My quarterback plays basketball, college basketball. I mean, I got a hell of a team. I don't want to go anyplace. And I get a call from Mason City, Iowa. Roger Clough is the superintendent. He's a Nebraska guy. He calls me out of the clear blue. Says, um, "Are you inter- Would you be interested? Uh, I've got a job. Uh, I've been following your career. It's a you know we have thirty five thousand in our community. One high school. We haven't had a lot of success. Uh, I've followed you. I'd like to bring you up here and talk." I said, "No, I'm not interested." He said, "Well, think about it. Talk talk to your wife." Um, I'll fly you both of you up here and interview. So I go home and I said, Sin, this guy called me from this town in Iowa. They want to fly us to the interview. She's this Friday. I said, I told him I didn't want to go. He, but he's calling tomorrow. She says, we don't have anything to do. Let's go. Wow. So we went. And long story short, um, Cindy's the one who told me to take the job. She's, they, they, they brought me back another time. And uh, wanted me to take the job. And she says, you know what? You know how to win. That's a hell of a town. Mm. That's a hell of a town. Let's take that job. And and back then, Zor, I was making about $8,000. <laughs> I think they'd probably pay me twelve. dollars like <laughs> Right, right. You know, so we did. We took the job and we went there and it was a great experience. And, you know, we go from a bad team to a good, really good team, to a state championship in three mm. years. And that's a year Hayden Fry came in. I had about five kids that everybody was recruiting. And uh, he ended up offering me a job, and I jumped wow. Wow, that's amazing. That is amazing. So you're there for eight years. Uh, no, 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 no. Oh, yeah, I was at Iowa eight years, yeah. Yeah. So there, I mean – at that point, are you thinking, you know, hey, I may be in the running for Hayden if he retires? Or are you, I mean, because the coaching profession is crazy. I mean, you could be coaching in one spot for one year and then be at another place for, for 15. I mean, so what was the idea or what, what were you thinking when you were at Iowa? You know what? I, I liked where I was. Um, my family was happy. My family comes first. Um, I had opportunities to leave, but, uh, we just had a good staff. I really liked Iowa city. Hayden was good to work for. He was tough. Hayden was tough. I learned a lot from Hayden and, uh, I had opportunities to go, but I, I just always felt that, um, no, this, this, I I don't want to leave. And after eight years, then I was out recruiting. The end of recruiting after that year, and I happened to run into Schottenheimer. Um, and he says, you know, he, actually, he and I played against each other in high school. Oh, wow. Okay. From neighboring high school in, in, back in Pennsylvania. And he says, uh, I'm going to go join Marty. And uh, would you be uh, – your name came up in a staff meeting. Wow. And uh, would you be interested? And I said, ah. I'm not, I'm not looking to leave. I didn't even think of, think about it. And then the next week, Coach Frack or Coach uh, Coach Holtz called. Who okay. called me? And, and uh, I'm going to tell you a story that no one knows. No, <laughs> very few people know. And so I go in, I go into Coach Holtz or Coach Fry's office because I, I I wouldn't have left. I I didn't care, and I was very happy. 
And I said, you know what, coach, I'm just going to give you a heads up. Uh, Lou Holtz called me about going to Notre Dame. And all he had to do was say, you know what, Barry, I, I really want you to stay here. But instead he said, uh, you know what, you look into that job, you better get that job. I walked out of that office. I went his office. I went right back to, to uh, my office. I called Cindy. I said, we're going to Notre Dame. He can't wow. talk to me like that. Wow. And, uh, you know, he doesn't have respect enough for me to talk to me wow. better than that. I'm going to Notre Dame. That's interesting. Oh, you know, and, and because you look at what that conversation did for the next five, ten years of your career, right? Oh, I mean, unbelievable. Like you said, if he says, you know, you you're, you're part of his family, you know, you've been here, you're ha- you're fine, you're happy. But yeah, I'll, for I'll, that to happen, give me a little love, I say. Mm, mm, wow, wow. Okay, so now you have had you have a chance to to come to Notre Dame. Is it kind of all? Is it? All it's cracked up to be. Notre Dame is one of the biggest programs in the country. Or, you know, is this this there's this guy up in front of you as the head coach? I mean, I'm sure you guys are getting paid shit because that, that was my understanding that you know what? Notre Dame didn't pay shit. I, I did I did get a raise okay. from 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 Iowa. I did okay. We'll All right. Okay. We weren't we were not breaking the bank back. Then. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> we were not breaking the bank. But I did get a raise to go to Notre Dame. Um, I have to tell you, Chris, there are a lot of guys who their 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 vision is to someday work at Notre Dame or work at Southern Cal or work at sure. State Pacific. I never had that vision. Okay. So I went in there. I wanted to work for Coach Holtz. Okay. I always admired him. I thought he, when he went to, to Minnesota and did what he, he did in a short amount of time. Right. And actually when I was a high school coach and Monty Kiffin was coaching for him at Arkansas, okay. I drove a car with some of my assistants down to watch one of his spring practice down at Arkansas. Wow. I, I always admired him. Okay. And so, um, I wanted to work for him. Uh, and when I, he and I talked, I, I just, I was like a sponge. I listened to everything he said. I, I really admired him. And uh, so I, 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 I just knew it'd be a good fit for me. And, uh, you know, I have confidence that I can, I can coach. So I knew that work out. <laughs> so the, at the time you're the linebacker coach, Foch Fazio is the, the, the defensive coordinator. He leaves. And is it just kind of automatic or is coach Holtz looking around or how did that happen? No. Um, actually, it was that um, we came back from the Cotton Bowl. Okay. You were very influential in Coach Holtz after that game. He talks about that. Yeah. You're the only guy crying in the locker room. Yeah. He wanted to cry. I felt like throwing up. And uh, that touched him. Mm. And so anyhow, I was with him. I'll give you a little scoop here. So he and I meet in northern, in the northern suburb at like a Denny's. Okay. Right after that game, because we're going to go to Woodstock, Illinois, to, to, to talk to a recruit. Okay. Jimmy Hartley, who I've been telling him we need to recruit him all along. Okay. And he wouldn't. He didn't like him. He didn't want to take him. All of a sudden, he got heat from the Chicago Notre Dame people, <laughs> and he realized he wants. I said, "Coach, I know the family. I recruited his older brother. We could get him if we went in early. He's he's committed to Iowa now. He is that that family is not going to send him. They're not going to flip. Now, I know that crew, and they're great people, and I love them to this day. They're friends. Wow. And so, but. Then we start talking, and uh, he made. He told me he made a change with Foge, and he wanted to talk to me about being a coordinator. 
And from that day on, we probably, I don't know how many times we met. He brought in coordinators from all over the country to interview. And you, as you know, he lived uh, probably four or five blocks from three, four blocks from me. Right. I'd go up like once or twice a week to interview. I said, oh, God damn. <laughs> Here's what I'll, t- I'll tell you this. I will tell you this. I know what you want. I will guarantee you we will be physical, we'll be sound, we'll have good fundamentals. And that, 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 that went right down the line. At the end, you know, I mean, he was bringing in guys, interviewing and, and, and so on and so forth. And in the end, no, it wasn't a slam dunk. Wow. And in the end, I just, I just said, Coach, I will guarantee you this. Boom, 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 boom. Mm. That's and amazing. We, and we, because I know what's important to him. You got to contain. You cannot blitz <laughs> 70 yards away. Zero blitz 70. I know all that. Stuff. <laughs> Wow. 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 You're listening to the Zorch podcast with Barry Alvarez. So now for some stroke of genius, he he says, yes, you you now have the job. I mean, are are those promises? Because this is, again, this is um, 88. And I mean, everything's new, right? I mean, you get some of these I older the guys. Kids. Okay. I knew the kids. Okay. Okay. I knew the players. Mm-hmm. But I have no coaches. Now I got to hire staff. So I'm thinking I want beef stew. George Stewart. Wow. Players love beef stew. He coaches special teams. He's coaching tight ends. He's bored to death. He's bored to death sitting in that offensive meeting room. <laughs> so I go, I'm by myself. I'm the wow. only defensive. I'm the only defense. I'm the only guy standing. Wow. So I go in. I said, uh, I knock on the off- their offensive meeting. I'm by myself. I, I need somebody to meet with. <laughs> <laughs> I need somebody to meet said, with. Coach, Send me somebody. I said, Coach, um, I think I think I can coach Beef Stew up. If he wants to coach defensive ends, outside linebackers, I mean, hell, I can teach him how to do that, you know. But I, because I knew the players loved him, right? And he was a good motivator, and he coached the special teams well. I knew he'd be a good defensive coach. So I said, Coach, can I talk to you? He comes out of the offensive meeting room. I said, uh, I, I think Beef Stew would be a good outside linebacker coach. He said. Let me go talk to Beef. He said something to Beef. Beef almost knocked the door. <laughs> get out that off of the <laughs> wow. Oh, that's a so great now story. Me beef. Oh we my gosh. We went down, we went down to Oklahoma. I said, let's go down to Oklahoma. They were just won the national championship. Let's see what they're doing. Then we started interviewing coaches and mm. and uh you know, that's when we hired John, Coach Palermo, did a great mm-hmm. job for us from Minnesota. Lou knew him. And then Chuck Heater. Chuck Heater never got enough credit for what the job he did coaching really? on secondary. Yes. I really thought. I still think, I tell people, he's one of the best assistant coaches I ever had. Mm. I wish I had got him. I had him here for a little bit um, at Wisconsin. But I, I, I wish – he was coaching with. I, I wish I had coached longer with Chuck because mm, okay. he, he he wouldn't leave. He wouldn't have come to Wisconsin when I got. He'd been the first guy I'd hire. He was a great coach. He did a great job for us. He's in Colorado State now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and here's the the interesting thing because when I've talked to players about this, I mean, we didn't. There was something in the air, and this is sound corny. There was something in the air. There was something different about that year. I, I, I don't know what it was. We practiced hard different. I don't know what it was, but there was something different. You, you had a lot of new faces. You had a new coaching staff on, on, the, defense, on the defensive side. And my question to you, and, and this is from a coach's aspect, did you kind of see what was going on? I mean, game after game? Or was it like, 
you know, were you guys kind of as stunned as we were about the, about our success? No, you know what? Get understands or uh, Notre Dame is Notre Dame, but um, we try to separate. I try to separate us defensively because I knew, you know, coach is hard on guys. And I can remember some, some of the older players saying to me, I don't want him yelling at us, raising hell all the time. And I said, well, you know what? You play good on Saturday. He'll leave you alone. Right, if you remember, right. I practiced so far away. From <laughs> he, had to work his, he had to drive that cart like a half hour to get to us. And, 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 I, I, and, I, and I knew, I know him well enough, and I knew him well enough after one year with him. If we played well, he's not going to mess with us. Right, right, right. And so you heard that me tell you that. <laughs> if you don't want Coach messing with you, down at you, raising hell, play well. Right. And uh, I just I had I had confidence in the guys we had. I really liked the chemistry of that the guys that we were. Co- I liked the linebackers that I was coaching inside and outside. You know, I, I I felt like like Frank. Frank was a washed up fullback that I take as an outside linebacker. I got him my first day there. They're going to run Frank out of the dock. <laughs> right, exactly. I said, oh, no, I'll take Frank. I mean, that, he, that's what he said. So I fire. so he was on the podcast, and I didn't know this. Obviously, I'm, I'm a younger kid, but he was like, Coach Holtz was about to take my scotch and bury him. I did. I, I said, you know, that's my first day. <laughs> run Frank out of Dodge. I said, no, 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 no. I'll take him. 6'4, 245. He can play. I said, you know, he's tough. I can teach him how to play. Uh, you know, but, uh, and, and then you got, the, the, then the knuckleheads. You know, Stoney's in and out. He's flunked out. He, he's, he's kicked out. Uh, Pritch is the same way. I like those guys. Mm. I can get those guys to play. They're mm. good players. I can get them to play. And Ned's a good player. We had a good bunch. We had a bunch of great players. They were just couldn't find their way. I, I'm kind of that way. I like those guys. <laughs> I can get them to play. Coach, let me have them. Oh, let me have them. Wow. And, and so that's what's interesting, though, because it was that attitude of more kind of like laid back as opposed to what was going on on the, on the other side of the field, like those, the leaders of our team kind of emulated and saw kind of how you were relaxed. You weren't high strung. You weren't freaking out. And that's what everyone was used to with coach Holtz. Then all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're able to kind of get these guys mentor these guys and we're having success. Well, there's a lot about rapport. There's a lot about teaching. You know, if you went through our practice on defense, you know, it was about down. I made you think throughout the practice. Now that you're going through team, you get through your individual and all that, but you go through team and it's, we're giving you down and distance. We're making you think and put you in game situations as you went through practice. So you had to think about it. Right. And, uh, and we could have fun along the way. And I had no problem with that because I like to have fun. But when it came time to play, I knew you'd play. And, and uh, I had a good, I really had a good feel for the whole group. Mm. Well, and so let me get back to then. So did you, was it just game by game or was it kind of like, hey, after the first two, these, these guys are clicking? Because, I mean, honestly, I mean, you had a brand new defensive line, and literally two of those guys were sophomores who hadn't even played. You had Jeff. It was me, Jeff, and, Drew, and Boo. I mean, I mean, how does that happen? On I'm, 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 I'm a, I'm a defensive line, who literally, that's important. Well, you know, uh, Coach Palermo, he, I had great confidence in him. We had good linebackers who would cover up all your mistakes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. And we really had a hell of a secondary now. Oh. We had a hell of a secondary. No one knew it. You know, but we, we, we really had a really good secondary. I mean, because um, if you think about it, I'm not going to interrupt you, but if you think about it, the big question mark had to be defense going into that year. 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, new coordinator, new play. I mean, come on. Yeah. You had to uh, think about it. You're a washed up linebacker. Yes. Jeff Alm hadn't played before. Just big, dark, skinny guy. Yep. Boo. Boo doesn't look like he can play. He walks yep. out there, you know, and you got uh, Franks at fullback lined up at defensive end. Um, you got Arnold Ali out there. He's a freshman. Yep. Um, you know, Ned can play. Stoney can play. Critch can play. And then secondary, you got Pat Terrell. He's a washed up receiver. Yep. I had, got Todd. Like I had a fight like hell to get him. <laughs> I coached out as a sprinter. I fought, oh. I, coached, I fought him for half a year. Finally, he gives him to me. Oh. We're going into pit, but we have the off week. He won right. the game. You know, <laughs> right, exactly, he exactly. He games for us. Pat Terrell is a great player, but he's not a good receiver. Mm. He's a great safety. Mm. So, you know, it all worked out. Um, we had good players, but I tell you what, Chuck Heater, John Palermo, those guys were really good coaches. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting to kind of see – kind of your side as a coach and then kind of ours as players because we, we obviously don't know what's going on. We don't know that you're literally in the, the defensive meeting room by yourself. You got to you have to go next door and see if you can grab Stu or somebody. So we start, here's how it started. He says uh, he wants me to hire Joe Moore. Okay. And he says, uh, Food paid you, told me Joe Moore is the best <laughs> coach he's ever had. I said, Coach, I like Joe Moore. <laughs> He never coached defense, but I said, you know what? You're the head coach. You want to hire him, hire him. So Joe Moore comes in. We sit in an office for half an hour. It's just me and him. We argue for a half an hour. Oh, my God. So I said, let's take a break. That's when I went in and I said, Coach, I think I think Joe should coach tight ends <laughs> and tackles. How about seeing – give me Stu. Tackle <laughs> train Stu. I can't train Joe. Oh, my God. <laughs> Oh, that's, that's amazing. how it all started. Oh, that's amazing. That is amazing. So we go through the year. We're winning games, obviously. Um, I mean, what was the – and I'm going to talk to you about two games in particular. One was the Miami game, but the other one's going to be USC. But, but first we had the Miami game. Um, again, around the campus, it was just a different feel. Like it felt like a different game. I mean, what was the game plan going into there? Because literally those were some really good players. Well, two great teams. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think back. I, you know, we we sat back on them. If I remember, we, we never blitzed Miami. I think we – actually, we, to win the game, we were rushing two. Right. I remember. If you remember <laughs> down on the goal line when they called – they said it wasn't a fumble, which doesn't make any difference because they right. t- Tony fumbled the ball right back to him. Right, exactly. Right, it doesn't exactly, make any difference. Exactly, right, right. But if you remember, you're hitting the nose guard and dropping. And drop, yes, right, exactly. So we're rushing two, and Boo gets pressure. Boo gets pressure. That's why we. That's you know that Amazing. helps us win the game. But um, I'd rather play them. I was I was hoping. I'd rather have them them have the ball in the twenty than the fifty. If they had more field, they were more dangerous. But sure, if we could sure. condense them because they could really wing it around. Mm-hmm. I, I just didn't feel comfortable. We hadn't played enough man and just play man against them and pressure them. Okay. So we really never pressured them. We were we were playing conservative on defense, but uh, we did what we had to do. Well. And then the game after USC, and the reason why I just feel that that, that the, the, the USC game, for me, which is my opinion, was kind of the most important game for us that year because of what happened kind of off the field, right? Yeah. So now you have two of our starters sent home, and apparently there was a meeting, which I, I wasn't part of because I was a sophomore, but Coach Holtz grabbed – the, the seniors and the, the 50 year guys and said, Hey, this is what happened. What do you guys think? And Frank said, I mean, they're, they're going around the room and Frank or, or Andy Heck was ahead of him because Frank was terrified. Frank said that had, I'll tell you what happened. First, As you were in the meeting, 
coach had a meeting with us first and uh, we said, we need to eliminate them. We need to set an example. Right. So then he went, I think to the seniors, but there was an all team meeting. Yes. But, 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 but what happened was there was a Andre senior Jones meeting first. Andre Jones stepped up and said, right. We're going to lose. I don't think this is fair. Right. No, he said, I don't think this is fair. Okay. They've been a part of the team. I don't think they should be kicked off for this. And that's when Frank jumped up yeah. and had his rant about, we're going to kick their ass one way or the other. If you don't believe that, get out of the room. You know, a little stronger than that, much stronger than that. It, no, it, it, but it, it, it sent the message. Absolutely it did. And I, I mean, I got chills now when we're talking about it. And I had him with Frank when he told the story. But for me, as a 19-year-old kid, that, that moment taught me so much more about leadership yeah. and – and the culture and everything else than some of Coach Holtz's meetings, some of your meetings, because it was the bonding of a team. It was a fifth year senior who had been through hell. I mean, they got, they, they, we didn't understand how bad they got. I mean, Frank was a fifth year senior. He was there when Miami beat the yeah. crap out of them, uh, 58 to seven, whatever it was. And this was all this emotion. And for a young punk kid, and I say this in respect of Andre because he's no longer with us, but for him, he needed to be he there. Had right to, to say, say that. that. That's what he believed. Absolutely. 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 That's, Just that's as what Notre Dame does. It allows you to say what you think. But Correct. now a senior is countering you. Yes. Um, so the thing I love about that game, I, I – we were there Thursday before we went to before we flew to Southern Cal, and there in came. We're watching film. We're drawing up our game plan, and uh, Chuck Heater, Palermo, and I, and and Beef Stew, and and in walks his former Notre Dame coach. He was coaching at another university now, but his family was still in, at Notre Dame, and he comes in and and sits in for about five minutes in our in our meeting room, and then he says, "You know what?" This is the bet Southern Cal. We, where he was coaching, then was he must have played Southern Cal. It was the best okay. team I've ever seen. You guys don't have a chance. That's wow. what he said. I got so pissed off. I didn't say a word. I didn't say a word. Wow. You know, you know bah, 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 bah. Oh, get your ass out of my meeting now. Okay, let us finish up. So, and I heard West West told a little bit about this, but. We didn't blitz all year because we didn't have to. We blitzed. We, Rodney Pete, we ruined his career. Uh, we seriously. blitzed him. I can remember. This is a great story. We're leaving at halftime. I think the score is, I don't know. Well, before the game, Coach says comes up to me. And uh, he's hanging around the defense a little bit. I said, Coach, what, why are you hanging, <laughs> hanging around here? He says, I said, you don't think we can stop? He said, they haven't punted the ball, and they, <laughs> they haven't had a turnover in oh I forget how many quarters. Right. Said, great. Great. They're due. Uh, you know, he, you know he, he doesn't look at it that way. Right, right, they right. They had a turnover in seven games. That's great. That's awesome. First turn. I said, that's great. We're due. They're, they're, they're due to turn it over. First series. Boom. We knock it loose. Mm. We go in for – Tony runs it in for 20 for a touchdown. If you don't, you don't know this, but the, our offense went three and a half quarters without another first down. I didn't even remember yeah. that. Three and a wow. half quarters without a first down. So wow. we're going out. We're going. We're leaving at halftime. Coach looks at me. Now we've got to pick six. <laughs> <laughs> we're playing our ass off. Like, <laughs> looks at, we're doing stuff we'd never done before. Oh. Like, they can't figure it out. Have, I know they can't figure it out at halftime. He looks at me. He says, "How are you doing?" I said. Oh, that's good. He said, that's good. Cause I'm having a terrible day. <laughs> I said, Coach, we're fine. We're fine. He finally figured it out in the fourth quarter. That oh. points up, but I'm telling you, we were, wow. we were really good. Oh. Oh. We built up. Amazing. We blitzed. We didn't. We blitzed almost every snap, and we had never blitzed all year. Right. Right. We right. just came up with a totally. 
different game plan. Which and talking to, I think we're talking to Scott or some Scott Kolkowski, somebody. I was talking to them about how the national championship game, although extremely important, was almost like a letdown because we had played. I mean, some great play, and, and I didn't realize this, but Major Harris, he's in the College Football Hall of Fame. He had some crazy stat, like he had like 5,000 yards passing and like 2,000 yards rushing. So, I mean, just some unbelievable stuff, but we shut him down so quickly. And although there were a couple fights in there, we got a couple guys kicked out. But it was almost like we, we were playing some tough teams that year. And for the national championship game, we, we, we knew we had the confidence. We had everything going into that. It was almost like, or at least for me, it was almost like a letdown. But I'm sure for the coaches, I mean, obviously having a chance to win a national championship was important. Yeah. I, um, <laughs> I can remember, Coach, you're getting all these fights. That's you. You're getting all these fights at the end of the game, and Coach comes running up to me. He's in my face. I mean, there's like a minute and a half left to go in again. Get some, get some, get some discipline in your defense. How are we going to win a national championship? You ever look at that? Cha- I, I don't know if it's on TV or not. I grab him by the shoulder and say, "Coach, in about a minute and a half, we're going to be national champions." Uh, uh, <laughs> Just kind of okay, Coach. Relax now. Right. Relax. Let our guys go. Well, and I want to be fair because. Unfortunately, we really want to fast forward past the following year because the 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 at least going into the last game, um, you've had you 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 have some opportunities, and one is Wisconsin, and you, you tell this funny story about how the AD Pat um, was was kind of wavering, and this is literally. The day before the game, I believe, right? Well, it's the day of the game, and I told him, if you're going to offer me the job, let me know. It was day of the game. He he said, well, I I don't know if I can do it because I have to get permission. I said, no, no, just let me know if you're going to offer me the job. We'll leak it. I'll give it to Roger Valdeseri. He'll leak it to the press. It'll be more more valuable in recruiting, which was ended up happening. (sighs) And and it it allowed me every – I I took the next day. I'm I'm in – these kids' homes in Wisconsin, mm. and and they're waiting for me, you know. And a lot of said that group, that class that I recruited, won the Rose Bowl. That's amazing. Well, what I want to talk about was what's the conversation with Coach Holtz at this point? I mean, is he expecting you to kind of get out of there, or is he kind of like, "Hey, I want you to stay"? I mean, what's what's the conversation with him? No, um, you know, the year before. You know, I had opportunities to go and and after when we won the national championship, Coach asked me after, after the game. He said, "Come and stop in my office. Come to my room." Okay. So I went down. And he said, uh, uh, "What do I have to keep do to have to keep you here?" And I said, "Coach, wow, I'm not going any place." I said, uh, it, every, "Every decision I make is on my family." I had opportunities that year. Whatever job was open, wow. You know, I was a hottest you know right. coordinator. I said, you know, it's all about my kids, um, and I, my daughter's going to start her senior year. I would never pull her out of school, and so on and so forth. The next year, I said, but here's what I want. Here's what you can do for me. Teach me how to be a head coach. Give me more responsibility. Okay. He says, yeah, hell, you're running half the team now. <laughs> you know, I said, no, teach me how to be a head coach. And and if you can't, throw me some of those crumbs. Or some of those speeches you don't want, throw those crumbs to me. <laughs> Wow. And, and he was great to, you know, and he, he, he was really good. And, and uh, so, cause I knew I was going to take something and I had Wisconsin, I had it zeroed in mm. and Chuck Heater had coached here and he knew the issues and I knew I could deal with the issues. So I had a good plan coming in. So the idea that we're playing on national television, you're coaching us, but the announcers are saying, yes, Barry Alvarez is going to be going to Wisconsin. I mean, you you can't buy that type of exposure. That's right. That's why I told him you have to release that. You have to let people know. 
because everybody everybody's watching that game. We're playing it's one against three. Right. Everybody right. in the country's watching the game. Right. So uh we gotta get that we gotta get that exposure because tomorrow I'm gonna be in their living rooms. Right, right, exactly. And, uh, so so you have a chance, first time head coach in college. I mean, what does that I mean? Are you is it kind of nonstop? Do you have a chance to kind of sit down and say, hey, you know, Cindy, this is what we, we've been working for, for for such a long time? Or was it like, bam, after the game, boom, 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 in, in a house here, in a house there? No, you take off. I had uh, I had some, I had coaches lined up, okay, ready to go, some assistants that I could hire. They were on, they're waiting for me in, in Madison. I got to Madison the next day. They're there in Madison. And we start, I mean, you just start immediately. And uh, I retained the person who had recruited Wisconsin to get me around the okay. state and see the top kids. Sure. I mean, you start working immediately. And, and, uh, cause you, you know, you're, you're really deep into, re- you're a, really less than a month away from right. signing. Right. Exactly. And, and so, and you're behind. And so you, you got to get going and, and we made, we had a lot of kids in Wisconsin flip Brett Moss, I think was, would have gone to Michigan state. Mm. Uh, he ended up being the you know big 10 player of the year, mm-hmm. offensive player of the year, Rose bowl MVP, mm. you know, all the, you know, all these guys that, that end up starting coming in that first year, we went out and got, mm. and, and brought a couple of my friends in from Iowa who I knew could recruit and, uh, uh, you know, so. Well, one of the things that I, I heard of legend, I obviously wasn't there, but it was, and apparently this is legendary because they are still talking about this press conference. But one of the reporters asked you, I've kind of got it written down here. Um, this is first day. Literally, you've had maybe two hours of sleep, if that. You're the, there at the podium. You're the new head coach of Wisconsin. And he says, what do you tell your fans? <laughs> and your response to that, which well, I, it's literally they're still talking about. Yeah. Well, um, I, I, I did not have two hours sleep. Uh, I had no sleep, you know, because we, you know, when, when you win at Notre Dame, you celebrate, <laughs> especially when you win a national championship. Right. right. And, and I had a 5 a.m. flight. The next morning, Jeez. straight to Madison, and you know, and I'm talking to you know my new AD and flying up there. So I go in there in this press conference, and and you're right, uh, you know, a few minutes into the press conference, I can remember the, the sports writer, and I, I know the guy now, okay, sports editor of the paper, and he's kind of surly, and he kind of a challenge me. What do you tell your, what do you tell your fans who? have seen nothing but bad football here for X amount of years. What do you tell them? You had less than 17,000 people in the last game here. What do you tell them? I said, you better buy your tickets right now because it ain't going to take long before you won't be able to get them. And I turned away from him. Well, and, and here's the thing, and because they haven't had the success, this is a bold statement for a new guy coming in. But I mean, to you, you feel as though you're going to do this. You've you've had success everywhere you went. Well, that's why I felt. I know how to win. Uh, give me a chance. I'm not going to do it right away. Mm-hmm. No, I, I'm not a magician, but uh, I know just get. Just be patient. I'm going to build this thing. Mm. And uh, I, I know how to win. And uh, I was very confident. So one of the things I thought was interesting, kind of doing my research, um, your first team meeting you have, and this is much like what was going on when Coach Holtz had his first team meeting, but can you kind of walk us through this a little bit? Because they're not used to kind of – this attitude, this swagger you have, the idea of, you know, hey, this is, we're about to go in, we're about to win some games. You walk in there and they're kind of lackadaisical, lean in, hats, earrings, the whole deal. Well, <laughs> I walk in the meeting room, auditorium, and we got a lot of, we got a 
we got a big, big bunch of guys. And they're all sitting in there and they're slumped. They got ball caps on. They got their legs up over the chairs in front of some of them. I walked in and I just scoped the room. And I said, take those fucking hats off. Mm. Sit your asses up straight in the seat. Put your feet put your feet flat on the floor. Look me in the eye. And I said, you know, we're not going to have many meetings. But when I meet, it's to dis- dis- disperse some, some information. Mm. And, and we're not going to meet just to meet. And I want your goddamn full attention and the story. And and as Don Davey, who's one of the good players on the team, <laughs> new sheriff in town. <laughs> I, absolutely. You, you have to be. And it, it's so interesting because although, yeah, new sheriff, new attitude, you guys go one and ten, which we're going to talk about that in a second. But I think there's another interesting story, kind of the fact you've had less than 17,000 folks for the last game now all of a sudden you're trying to get people there, trying to come up with ideas, and this student happens to kind of get your attention. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so I'm sitting there. I'm, I'm there probably a week. I'm, I'm, I've got a million things going on. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get everything going on. I'm trying to get attitudes. I'm trying to work on players, staff. I'm trying to get – people within the athletic department squared away. Sure, sure. And, Buy in. And my secretary walks in and she says, there's a student out here to see her. I said, oh, I don't have time for a student. And this big head <laughs> sticks his head. Big head comes around the corner. And I'm, by then I'm on the phone. I got a call. He, I go like this. I point to the phone. He says, okay. Next thing I know, he's sitting across. <laughs> wow. And he says, uh, my name's Kenny Dichter. He said, I'm a, I'm a red shirt junior. <laughs> he said, uh, he's a New York kid. He says, um, I have confidence you're going to win her. I saw I, that really makes me feel a lot better, Kenny. <laughs> you have confidence in me. Right and, student. and I said, uh, what can I do for you? He said, listen, you want to fill that stadium, don't you? And I said, yes, I do. He said, I can, you have to start with the students and I can do that. I said, well, how do you do that? So he gives me a plan. We're going to sell debit cards. Okay. We're going to sell them a card for X amount of dollars, say 25 bucks. We That gets you in the, in the stadium. We get you a free T-shirt. We're going to call give them, it belong to a club called Bleacher Creatures. Okay. And uh, I said, you know, it sounds, it sounds, it sounds like it, this, this might work. So I pick up the phone. I call the chancellor. I said, I've got a student here that has a great idea. Would you follow up? She said, send him over. So I sent him over. He sells it to her and he, he says, uh, oh, and by the way, um, I need somebody to pay for the T-shirts. You have somebody to buy the T-shirts? She, she says, yeah. She picks up the phone, calls uh, a guy named Tom, Tom Pyle with, uh, at that time, I forget his company. And uh, he says, yeah, we'll buy the T-shirts for the students. Bleach your creatures, put this thing on. And, uh, and he stops and he says, oh, and by the way, they have to buy them for me. He had a T-shirt <laughs> shop down on State Street. He had his own store. He had to buy the T-shirts for me. And I get 50 cents a kid. Oh. So he cut his own deal. And since he, he's he's been like a second son of mine, um, he's since started Marquee Jet mm. and Net Jets. Mm. And uh, now he, he's the founder and co-founder. Uh, co- he's the founder and CEO of uh, Wheels Up. Oh, that's an amazing been a great story. friend and a great friend i'm on actually i'm on they just went uh public okay i'm on their board we oh that's, congratulations that, that is <laughs> terrific but, but that's a great story right i mean that's one of those stories that again certain situations in our lives that happen and then all of a sudden you take advantage of them and the the, the idea that he had the courage, the spunk, the chutzpah to kind of go in there and, you know, meaning, hey, you know, I'm on the phone, come back later. He goes, okay, great. And he sits down. That's, that's, that's I had him speak to uh, my development group. Okay. <laughs> About five minutes. That's all I had. To, he told him, when they say no, when you make an ask and they say no, that means not now. <laughs> that's great. Wow, that is that is that's terrific. 
So you've you've had success everywhere you went. First year, one in ten. What is that like? I mean, are you saying, you know, hey, did you know this was going to happen? I mean, obviously, you don't want something like that to happen. No, but no, I just I I uh, I knew where we were. Okay. The thing that I liked the last game of the year. Uh, we're playing Michigan State at Michigan State. We have we got one win. Um, they're a really good team, good George Perlis team, classic. And we go down to the wire with them. Our guys played their fannies off, played hard for us. And we have a, we have a little dump pass that r- r- rolls through somebody's hands, or we win the game. And, uh, and I told I told the kids I, I knew I had them after that. You know, the senior is a group of seniors. But I knew I had the guys. I knew right. they're were, they were following our lead. We are going to be good. And I told our seniors I appreciated them sticking with us. And uh, when we go to the Rose Bowl, I'm going to send you all watches. And mm. I did. Wow. Four years later, we go to the Rose wow. Bowl and win it. And I sent all those seniors watches. Mm. Mm. Well, and this is what I think that happens over time is – the respect and the understanding that you as a coach care for your players and not every program, not every coach will say, Hey, you guys were the foundation. It didn't go well that year for you, but I'm going to take care of you. And all of a sudden four years later, they're receiving a watch in the mail. I mean, that's something that's, that's a lot of coaches don't do, but more importantly, when you have success, you know where it came from. It came from on the backs of these players, of these seniors. Yeah, you, you had to build a foundation. And they gave me a foundation of trust and effort. They, they weren't good enough or they had one game or I wouldn't have had the job. Right, right, right. You know, right so I, right. I, I knew all that. But they bought in. And they were good. They, they, they tried their damnedest. They really did. They just weren't good enough. And then, you know, we were playing with a bunch of young kids. I can remember going out and we're going to play Ohio State. And I see these guys with the big hamstrings and guns. And <laughs> like, God damn, I look at my players. They look like high school kids. <sighs> Four years later, my guys got guns and hamstrings. <sighs> wow. you know, so we, we can play with these cats. Wow. You know, so it, I, I knew it would change. But, so, uh, but these guys bought in, and that's all I wanted. Mm-hmm. You win your, the first of three uh, Big Ten championships. And you have a chance to now, Big Ten leader, go to the Rose Bowl. Do you kind of share? I mean, that, that's an experience. You, you, now, you've been there before with Iowa, but as a head coach of a program that you literally turned around, I mean, what's that like? Well, um, I learned how not to, 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 to manage that week when I was at Iowa. Okay. So I was really ready. I mean, I, I studied. Uh, we played against Washington, and uh, then the next year, I think, or year after that, the Big Ten. We could go there and visit. Okay. At, um, at, if you're in the Big Ten, and I, I'd go watch Don James practice, and I studied <laughs> what he did because he had so much success there, and uh, so I knew I was ready because we had screwed everything up everything possible. We didn't give our guys a chance the way we prepared. So um, I had a really good plan on how to, uh, how to manage a bowl game. And, and, and I'll tell you what, Cindy, you have to manage your, your families, your coaches, families, uh, and, and not only players, but you have to manage the rest of it. So mm. Cindy and I had talked about this, you know, you, just think about this. We're going to LA. You're going to get there Christmas Eve or Christmas. Yeah. Christmas Eve. And you have a per diem that the school gives you, you know what they cost to, just to go for a, a, a breakfast at, at LA, your, your, your per diem. And I got coaches with you know, a number of kids. Sure. They're going to be out of money soon. They can't afford that. Mm. So we got to take care of our coaches. So Cindy and I came up with a plan to take care of the families. I put her in charge of the families. Wow. How to, ha- how to handle the families, how to have a breakfast room for the families, wow. how to ha- have entertainment for the families. So when a coach comes back from practice, right. his sit- wife and kids aren't sitting there pissed off right. at him. They're happy because mm-hmm. they've been entertained all day. They've been to Disneyland. 
They have mm. enough money to spend. Um, so all that's important. And we, we, we had it all thought out. Mm. So we're ready. We're ready. And, and uh, you know, we were big underdogs. Yep. UCLA. And, and that's perfect. I love that. <laughs> so the idea of now thinking, I mean, at this point, were you thinking about, you know, hey, um, so this is after your third uh, Big Ten third title. Year. The idea of there's a place where I'm going to, I mean, I don't want to leave. I mean, are, are you thinking about when, when I do make this transition, I, I'd like to be the AD? And it, is that when you're thinking about it or is this no. not like coaching? No, that, that has to be when the AD is ready to go. Okay. You know, when Pat was ready to go, I, right. you know, I wasn't thinking about that. I had, I had to think about a lot of other things. You know, I had NFL teams contacting me. I had other colleges contacting me. What do we want to do? Uh, is this where we want to stay? Are we happy here? Do you want to go to the NFL? Right. Um, you know, it wasn't until like 2000, something like that, when our, athletic, our commissioner, Chancellor, came to me and said, would you take both jobs? Would you take the athletic director's job? We're building the uh, – Pat's going to retire. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to build, you know, we're in the process of building suites and all those things. Right. And, and uh, we stopped at 9-11. We needed a big donor. And so fundraising stopped. And people want to know who's going to be in charge of the athletic department. Sure. They trust you. Would you take both jobs? Uh -huh. So that's when I had to make a decision. Well, even bef before that, you mentioned other opportunities NFL opportunities. I don't, I don't want to know what schools, but I mean, what keeps you at Wisconsin? I mean, every coach wants to hopefully, if they want, have a chance to go in the, in the, in the big leagues, in the pros. You, you see everybody do it. I mean, was it just not the right fit, not the right teams? I mean, what was I, the idea? I, I, I really had no desire to coach in the NFL. Okay. I, for, I, I don't know why. I like college athletics. I like co coaching. I like sure. the campus. I never minded recruiting. I like to recruit. Okay. Um, and so it was always flattering when an NFL team came around. And uh, the only one Cindy would have pushed, actually, the Bears called one year. We were at the Rose Bowl, I think, 99. Okay. And uh, someone came and said, you know, the Bears called. And I told him you weren't interested. And it wow. was one of my, like, one of my, uh, whatever. And Cindy went crazy. She said, that's the only job I'd let you take. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my but God. I, I just I just never had any desire to do that. And, and same with other schools. Mm -hmm. uh, there were some very lucrative office, offers in some schools, big brand names that that you, you got to really work hard to screw up. Sure. Um, but in, in push comes the shove, this was my place, you know, and uh, – it was never just never enticing enough mm. for, for us to want to leave. Mm. So you take on the role, head coach and athletic director. Um, immediately, are all the coaches on board? Because oftentimes at big programs, coaches, even some student athletes feel that men's basketball, football, they get everything. I mean, what's that? I mean, are all the coaches bought in? Yeah, or... I, I think so. You know what? I never big timed anybody. Okay. As a football coach, I take all the coaches. You know, first thing I, I used to do things with the coaches. I take them on trips. All the head coaches, I make them get, all get on a bus. Uh, every coach, and we we go to a trip, like to the Dells, or we go to some place in the state. Sure. And we'd play golf one day. We'd spend two days together. Okay. And then we'd have meetings and talk about recruiting and, and, and best practices that we mm -hmm. all use to try to support one another. And, mm -hmm. and, and so I'm the head football coach and the, I'm, so I'm not, I'm not big time in anybody. So I wouldn't let anybody big time anybody. We were all okay. on the same page. Okay. And so I never had that issue uh, with, with coaches saying, who the hell, you know, you, you, you're some big shot. I never, because I, I never big timed anybody. Okay. Well, and this is going to be very unique, and this happened to you twice. Um, 
it was kind of unfortunate because I was kind of talking around this time and I think you were very, very shocked, just like everyone else was around the country. But in 2012, um, you, your coach left and it was a shock to you. And there was uh, one particular player um, who actually made that question or, or actually asked that question. I believe it was Mike Taylor. Mike Taylor. Mike doesn't say two words. He's a tough, hard-nosed <laughs> linebacker. He didn't, he didn't share two words with me his whole career. Oh. I was in New York, and it's the day, the night that I found out that Brett had. He, he, he finally, you know, we finally called me and said he's leaving. And uh, I, I, I'm getting, I, you know, I got a million calls, but I got one from Green Bay. Who's the hell is calling me from Green <laughs> Bay? And so I called back. It's Mike Taylor. He says, Coach, he's he's a linebacker, good linebacker. He says, we want we just talk to the players. We want you to coach us. Mm. I said, Are you kidding me, Mike? No. I said, well, let me think about it. So one thing, you know, it always comes back that that's why, when the hell are we there? We're there for the kids. Sure, sure. I mean, I have the chills now because as a player and as an administrator, I, I, I could, I mean, it's – it's amazing. But what do you feel at this point? I mean, you, you have, there's a senior that's not talkative, a leader on the team. Your coach just left you. There's a lot of emotion going on. And the person that you would think would, would be the last person to talk to you has called you and said, coach, we want you to leave. I mean, what is that feeling like? Well, it was shocking initially. And then, um, then it's, um, you know, then, then, then you feel proud that they feel that way about you mm. and you say, God damn, we're here for these guys. Let's right. do it. Right. Right. And, and quite frankly, Cindy still beats me up because she thinks we could have won that game if I had handled <laughs> it differently. And, and she's probably right. But the next time around, I did it differently, and we won. Well, okay. So I was going to say, so literally two years later, <clears throat> you find yourself in the same situation, and the coach leaves. And, again, it's, I mean, players who come to you and say, coach, uh, coach. This, this one was a little different because I have a grandson on the team. Okay. And he's very sensitive about – People knowing he's my grandson, he I didn't come sure. there because. Really? Of, and wow. uh, so it's a, you know it's a funny it it, it it happened at the same. I'm, I was in New York again <laughs> to the College Football Hall of Fame, and my phone rings. I'm stuck in the airport, and my deputy calls and says, "You've got to call Gary Anderson. Wants to talk to you." I said, "Well, put him on the phone." He says, "No, he wants to see a first. So I said, listen, I, I don't know if I when I can get out of here, but put him on the phone. So he gets on. He says, I'm leaving. I said, where now are you going? Going to Oregon State. Oh, my. Okay. I said, call a team meeting. I think I can get out of here quickly to our flight, give, you know, such and such a time. So I walk in the team. I walk in. He starts his team meeting. And it's it's uh, he starts it and says, listen, this is never easy, but I'm leaving. I'm going to Oregon State. I love you. You know, I'm going to be in the office tomorrow between uh, 11.30 and 12.30. If you want to stop by and say goodbye, I'll see you. That's my that's my intro. So I, now I walk in. I got oh. guys, I'm looking at the seniors. They don't care. <laughs> the, <laughs> they the juniors, right. the juniors uh, kind of the same. Sophomores a little rattled. The freshmen, they're rattled. Mm. They, this group re recruited these guys. Right, right. So now I got to talk to them. And, uh, you know, I, just, I, I, I and basically I told them. I try to give them a life lesson. I said, you know what? Don't be afraid to change. You know, you're going to have you have to live with change uh, the rest of your life. Things are going to change. Adapt to it. Uh, trust me. I promise you I'll hire you a good coach. And I'll promise you a good bowl experience. And uh, I finished the meeting. Every kid, every kid in that room came up and gave me a hug. Mm. And then I saw the seniors over there in the corner, and they didn't come up. We want you to coach the team. 
So I said, eh, I don't know. I did this last time. I don't know about this. They said, Coach, we will, we'll be in your office. I said, think about it. So I, on my way home, I called my grandson. I said, Joe, I said, Senior, seniors want me to coach his team. What do you think? Are you okay with this? Mm. And he says, you know what, Grandpa? I think it would be awesome. Besides wow. that, we need a little swagger on the sideline. <laughs> I can give you that. I don't know if I can coach worth the shit. But wow. I <laughs> wow. But, I mean, and, and again, I mean, not that you needed this again, but it makes you feel good that you're doing such a good job as an athletic director that – they feel that they can come to you as players and ask you to do something that you haven't done in a, in a couple of years. And then, then your grandson is proud enough to even say, hell yeah, be, be our coach. That, yeah. That's again, that was pretty cool. Feel. That was pretty good. Yeah. And I told him, I said, listen, if you, and I told him the next morning, I'll do this, but I want you to understand I'm going to change things. They just got to be 59, nothing. <laughs> in the championship game. And I said, I have to get this out of their system. You know, sure. I, I got to go back to rebuilding their <laughs> confidence. Their yeah. yeah. So I said, we're going to change how we do everything. I'm not going to, you know, I don't like the way you, I fired the strength coach. We're going to change how we lift. We're going to change how we practice. We're going to go mm. back to 20 minutes a day inside drill. You know, we're, we're, <laughs> right we're going to get physical. Uh, we're going to get stronger with what, I don't know if you can get stronger <laughs> before a right. game, but I'm going to tell they are. Wow. And, and this is what we're going to do. We're playing uh. a, a really a good Auburn team, mm -hmm. and they're very good. And uh, I said, if you want me to do that, I, and we're going to change how we do this. I'm, we're going to play. We're going to practice and play the way I want to do it. The way so I, I got to get fifty nine nothing out of their head and and, and, right. and get give them some confidence and. They went in, they played their fanny way. It was a hell of a game. We won overtime. Mm -hmm. You are listening to the Zorch podcast with our guest, Barry Alvarez. We're going to wrap up a little bit, but I had a chance to spend some time with you um, when, you're, when you were the athletic director. And you talked about how the whole place, not only the football program, but the whole place needed kind of a change. And I thought it was so visionary to hear someone who was a football coach to talk about logos, to talk about where people sat. And then all of a sudden you were giving me a tour. You were showing me kind of the evolution of what the, the W was, your logo, your trademark before you got there and what you've done to kind of change that and kind of change the overall philosophy. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, um, I just felt like we needed a makeover and a, 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 and feel proud of things. And not that they weren't proud of what they had, but there was a block W and there's a, another W on our uh, crest mm -hmm. on our field house. And I wanted to do something on our helmets. I wanted the W to <clears throat> stand out. I don't want it real flashy, but I want it to stand out. And when somebody saw it, they knew it was Wisconsin. So we gave it to uh, uh, an engineer with some company here in town. And they every week they I gave him a bunch of helmets and he'd come back. <laughs> they look like these, you know, like a race car helmet with all these, all this. No, no, I okay. want it clean. I want two stripes. I want. So he came back with this Motion W, which we have now. And I said, that's it. That's what I'm looking for. Mm. Something clean, something that, that's unique to us. Blah, blah, blah. That's our logo. And this is how we're going to dress. This is how we're going to have two stripes. You know, you go back to like Notre Dame, no stripes. It, it, you see the, I like old school. Right. And so uh, that's what I wanted to establish. And, and I wanted people to know who we were and be clean and proud of it. And, and then I did it with the entire department. You know, when, when we went to Under Armour, they designed our uniforms, everything, all the the uh, the 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 writing, the numbers, everything mm -hmm. is consistent mm -hmm. with 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 us and who we are. That's that, that's that's important. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. It is. So you've decided that you wanted to walk away from kind of everything, so to speak. Um, 
what's the conversation you have with Cindy? What's the conversation that you have with yourself? Is this something that's been going on for the last couple of years? I mean, what did you, what made you do it? Retire now? Yeah, I, actually I was ready. Uh, Cindy and I talked about this. I was going to retire last January okay. before COVID. Okay. Um, and, you know, then COVID, you know, we, we have COVID and I talked to our chancellor and I said, it's not fair to hand this over to okay. some new person to make decisions. You're going to, you're going to have layoffs. You're going to have, uh, you're going to ask people to take pay cuts. Sure. You're going to have to do make some tough decisions. Uh, I, I wouldn't want some new person to have to make those decisions, and go through that. I'll hang on through the first, I'll do this through the first of the year. I'll get us through COVID. Mm. And, uh, so actually I waited an, an additional year before, before I actually retired. Mm -hmm. Well, and then even so, I mean, being an athletic director, being an athletic team, being at a, a, a big time school, COVID is a challenge in itself. I mean, there literally, there's not a playbook for this. So, I mean, no, what happens? No. <laughs> well, you know, you're, you're, we're anticipating a hundred million dollar loss, and so you, you, you know, you got to put all this together. You got to figure out how you're going to trim things and and uh, how you're going to make that work. You're trying to, you know, I'm, you know, then then the league. We're sitting there with Athletic Gray every morning, seven a.m. I'm on a Zoom call with the other athletic directors and Big Ten office, and we're trying to figure things out and where we are because, you know, things changed every day with COVID and what we were doing, what was, you know, the testing and how you test and, you know, what's what we can do, what we can't do. And so it was a free-flowing thing. It was very flexible. Uh, I was in charge of, of getting us back to to playing. Mm -hmm. so, so I'm having – you know, I was, I was the head of that committee, you know, you're meeting with 14 coaches and, and athletic directors, you're trying to put a schedule back together and you work with TV because they're very important in all this. So that was, uh, that was as hard as it gets. Mm. I, I can't ever imagine anybody going through what, what all the athletic directors had to go through sure. last year through COVID. Mm. But, but I thought we did, you know, I thought it was really good, a really good exercise with the league office. And you got, you know, Kevin, Kevin Warren was a first year mm -hmm. commissioner, you know, thrown in the middle of it. I said, I said, you know what, Kevin, you know, there's no book on the shelf. It's, <laughs> you go to and says, how do I get through this pandemic? Right. right. You know, no one's ever gone through this or no one's ever done this before. So, um, you know, you got to roll with the punches, hang loose, be flexible and uh, be nimble and work through it. Um, Coach Trevor, this I, I could spend another hour talking and just learning from this. This has been great. The, the the one thing I do want to talk about, and, and this is the last thing, you've reached this retirement and happen to now be an advisor for the Big Ten for football operations. How does how does that work when in an environment where literally, oh, by the way, around the corner, you just had uh, Oklahoma and Texas go to the SEC. I mean, well, that doesn't affect us, right? You know, so much. I, I just think, you know, you that I think that put everybody's antenna up. What can happen? Sure. Um, I think the alliance that with us talking with the, the ACC, Jim Phillips is a was a, is a good colleague of ours who's mm -hmm. who's at Northwestern and and uh, the Pac-12. Um, we're, we're alike in conferences as, as far as philosophy and types of schools. And we, we can do some things as far as staying together, as far as votes and, uh, you know, possible potential of scheduling, mm -hmm. uh, which is, could be very lucrative for all of us as we look into the future. So, um, I, I think, you know, obviously the Texas, Oklahoma thing instigated that but uh i, I think it, i think it was a smart move and something that uh, uh that we had to do as a big 10. well and i think we're in in better hands because of your 32 years of experience being a head coach being an athletic director 
I mean, really understanding from a player's aspect, a former athlete, understanding how this is going to affect the the, the, the actual athletes. Um, the last thing I want to say is one of the interesting things you told me as I was an athletic director at Chicago State way back when, we were having a conversation and you said, Chris, the most important thing are the student athletes. And I was like, well, yeah, I got it so far. He's like, no, 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 you don't understand. When you're looking at facilities, when you're looking at food, when you're looking at transportation, always think of the student athlete. And I was kind of like, I was obviously listening to you, but didn't understand. And you started to break it down. You talked about really everything that you do as an administrator, the bottom result should result that you are taking in consideration the actual student athlete. And I'm talking about when it's hockey, I'm talking about golf, I'm talking about everything. And yeah. I thought that was one of the most prolific things you were able to tell me because I took that to heart because understanding that anything that you do will affect your student athletes. Transportation, um, you know, making sure they're the proper bus, making sure they don't have to take a bus if it's too far away. I mean, all these things will affect the psyche of the student athlete. So I want to say thank you, but more importantly, thank you from the thousands of student athletes that were able to learn from you, be in your environment, and were able to kind of get help, get that assistance to really become as successful as they were because of your leadership. So as a student athlete, from a player, from a coach who you coached, who, who you gave advice to, thank you, thank you, thank you. You've done an amazing job, and the athletic industry is going to be it was better for you to be in. Thank you. I appreciate it. And, and what you said is what I, what I meant, you know, that's why we're in this business is about the student athletes and we should never forget that they should always come first. Very true. I would like to thank everyone for watching and listening to this episode of the Zorch podcast conversations with leaders and legends. This podcast, along with our other podcasts will be on my YouTube page at youtube.com slash Chris Zorch 50, as well as on Apple, Spotify, um, iHeart, and Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your local podcasts. If you haven't already, please subscribe to my YouTube page and hit the bell to be notified when we have new content. Also, I'd like to have a special mention of Coach Alvarez's podcast, because this has been great. I've had a lot of information, but more importantly, please have a chance to, to listen to this it's called Barry Alvarez in his own words, and it's being hosted by Matt LePay, who was the um, game announcer he's, for you guys. He's the voice. He's the voice of the Badgers. Okay. Also does the Brewers. Okay. And it's a six-part episode at first, and I know you guys are going to be doing it throughout the year. We're going to do two. We're going to do two a month. Um, our first two. I think the first one's went up today. Okay. Uh, we'll have Bob Stoops, then Herb Street coming up. Oh, it's that's on great. IHeart. So that's down, great. Download the iHeart app. Absolutely. IHeart video, and then, and then uh, go to search under Barry Alvarez, and you'll pull them up. And, and and I want to encourage people, and I'll put a link to this podcast over to that one as well. But it's so informative because it really kind of, and I think what's great is that you talked about kind of being your, your, your time in Wisconsin over six episodes. So it's not just, you know, an hour here and you're done. It really talks about the journey and, and the culture change and everything that you had to do. And I learned so much about you as an individual, as a man, as a coach, but more important, I think everybody will have a chance to as well. So please, I want to encourage everyone to check out Barry Alvarez in his own words, the, the podcast. Coach, again, this was great. Uh, I, I'm honored to have had a chance to spend this, this time with you. Uh, go Badgers. My pleasure. All right. It's a pleasure, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. See you. All right.